Hey guys, Sean here for Who Culture, and just before we get started, I just want to take a second to let you know that this video is brought to you in association with Doctor Who, The Lonely Assassins. A thrilling, narrative-driven, found phone type of game that's just been released on iOS, Android, and Steam, but more on that now in a second. One thing Doctor Who is quite good at is finding a balance between fan service and actually serving the plot, generally coming down on the latter rather than just pandering to the former. Let's analyze some of the biggest examples of recent years. With that in mind, I'm Sean Ferrick for Who Culture, and here are 10 Doctor Who Easter eggs hidden in plain sight. Just before we get started, I just want to take another second to tell you about our sponsor, Doctor Who, The Lonely Assassins. Now, I mean, if we're being honest, we Whovians, we don't always get the same love from game companies that some of the other fans do. So I'm really excited to get the chance to talk to you about this game today. Created by our good friends, the digital entertainment studio Maze Theory with Kaigen Games in partnership with BBC Studios, Doctor Who The Lonely Assassins transports players into a dark mystery amidst a series of sinister events occurring at Western Drumlands. A chance encounter with a discarded fall on the streets of London ignites a thrilling mystery as the player receives an urgent call from ex-unit scientist Petronella Osgood, played by Ingrid Oliver. With whispers of a returning and terrifying menace, will you be able to aid her and uncover the truth? One of the really cool things about this game is that it got it was shot on location in London and Cardiff. So Doctor Who The Lonely Assassins combines real world footage with open-ended puzzle gameplay. Now it invites players to view a virtual phone to help uncover clues and get to the truth. You can read messages, you can view videos and answer calls, which will allow you to put the clues together to figure out the true events that are going on at Wester Drumlands. There's even a very special voice cameo by current Doctor Jodie Whittaker as well. Check out the link in the description below. And just once more, a huge thanks to Mazed here and the whole team at Doctor Who The Lonely Assassins for letting us be a part of this launch. Seriously guys, I've played this, you are going to love it. 10. Star Trek Under the Lake. I'm gonna be honest, if you've watched any of the other uh, Trek culture videos or some of the Who culture videos, you'll know why this one has a little bit of a special place in my heart. In the episode Under the Lake, which is in the ninth season of the revival, the 12th Doctor and Clara find themselves in the drum, which is effectively a big underwater facility off the Scottish coast. While they're there, they pass a mural on a wall, which is of a big sea dragon effectively chomping down on some people. Those people are wearing very specific colors. You've got three of them in the boat, One's wearing yellow, one's wearing blue, and one's wearing red, and there's one fella getting eaten. Now, these are confirmed to represent the various departments in the original series of Star Trek. You've got yellow for command, blue for medical and science, and red for target practice. As well, you also have some of the crew are hiding behind some locked doors. That locked door has a number on it, 1701. Again, anybody familiar with Star Trek should recognize that straight away. It is, of course, the registry of the Enterprise 9 Magpie branded amp. In the second series, the 10th Doctor and Rose find themselves in London just in time to watch the Queen's coronation on TV. Now they're a bit surprised by this because they were heading to see Elvis, but when has the Doctor ever really got it right? Now Rose quite correctly points out that a lot of the houses around have TV aerials, which is unusual for the time, but of course, who's supplying all of these but Mr. Magpie? of Magpie's electronic stores. Unluckily for Mr. Magpie, and for a whole bunch of people who like having a face, The Wire, which is effectively an alien that has inhabited all of these televisions, is starting to feed through the screens and eventually kills poor old Mr. Magpie as he and the Doctor work to stop it from uh, securing its deadly plan. Now, potentially out of a sense of guilt, the Doctor still sees fit to put some patronage toward Magpie Electronics. Flash forward to the ninth season and the 12th Doctor, who really spent a lot more time playing electric guitar than, than I anticipated, uses a Magpie branded amp to get the sound out. Nice. Eight, a very important date. 
Trying to select just one Easter egg from the day of the Doctor was next to impossible. There are so many crammed into almost every frame of this 2013 special. While trapped in a cell, the three Doctors talk about each other, laugh at each other, and the Eleventh Doctor realises that this is what he's like when he's on his own. What the Eleventh Doctor also does is he scratches the numbers 231163 into a pillar. Now what that number does is activate a vortex manipulator that Captain Jack bequeathed to Eunice on one of his deaths that Clara is able to use to bounce back in time to save the Doctors. Now, what's important about those numbers is that the 23rd of November 1963 was the day that Doctor Who aired An Unearthly Child, the very first episode. And what's more, earlier in the episode, Clara passes by a clock that reads 5.16pm, which is the exact time that Doctor Who began. 7. Classic Daleks in the Asylum the seventh season of the revival opens with the Doctor, Amy and Rory, aided by Oswin, running around this Asylum of the Daleks. Now this is where the baddest of the bad of the bad go, and the Dalek Parliament, which is just a cool sentence to say, sends the Time Lord there because they don't want to go. Once inside, the Doctor then learns of a room that is containing the worst of the worst which are Daleks who have survived encounters with him. Now, among these Daleks is a very special one, and it's the Special Weapons Dalek that first appeared in Remembrance of the Daleks, a Seventh Doctor serial. Ties like this between the modern era of Doctor Who and the classic era of Doctor Who are visual cues that it really is the same continuity, even if new Doctor Who feels very different from classic Doctor Who. Six. The Cybermen walk out of their pods, the Nightmare in Silver. Neil Gaiman's second episode for Doctor Who, Nightmare in Silver, saw the return of the Cybermen. They got quite scary again after they had been slightly overused in their modern original design. Now, when they begin moving, they exit some, some very familiar looking pods. Going back all the way in time to the second Doctor and his serial, The Tomb of the Cybermen, the Doctor, Jamie McCrimmon and Victoria find themselves at a sort of rebirth of the Cybermen again. They see the Cybermen coming out of the tomb with just an incredible soundtrack. And the actual look and feel of that tomb in that serial is effectively lifted and put wholesale into a nightmare in silver. Now the funny thing is that it's more of a visual cue than anything else and nobody really talks about it going forward but it immediately ties the two stories and these two iterations of the Cybermen together nearly 60 years apart. 5. West Ham Obduro Companion to the 13th Doctor, Graham O'Brien, always wears a little pin on his lapel. That pin is the shield for West Ham. Actor Bradley Walsh actually got a say in designing that pin. And if you look very closely at it, you'll see that just under the shield it says West Ham, and then there is Obduro. Now that is the Latin term for endurance. Cool, you know? But look even closer again. The coloration on the W, the H, and the O is slightly different. So in every episode that Graham is wearing his pin, he's wearing who on his shoulder. The 13th Doctor's uniform doesn't really have an awful lot to do with classic Doctor Who, but if you think back to the end of the fourth, the entirety of the fifth and sixth, and the waistcoat of the seventh, the little question mark was on the lapels of all of those Doctor's clothes. Now maybe Jodie Whittaker's Doctor doesn't rock a question mark on her lapel, but at least her companions are uh, Stepping up to the plate there. Four, almost everything in The Timeless Children. When Tecteon is shown standing in full Gallifreyan regalia, there's two figures standing on either side. One is meant to be Omega, and one is meant to be Rassilon. Now, Rassilon was cast with an actor who looks like Don Warrington. Now, to some people, that name might not mean anything, but to others, Don Warrington was the voice of Rassilon for the Big Finish audio productions. So this is a deep cut Easter egg, but it's a big, huge nod to that entire expanded universe. Three, the Doctor's many names. Twice Upon a Time is the final episode for Peter Capaldi's 12th Doctor, and in a loving homage, 
cast David Bradley as the first Doctor, having these two meet together. Along the way, they encounter a race called the Testimony. Now, what we discover is that the Testimony meet people at the moment of death, hear their stories, and keep their stories alive. It's quite a lovely version of the afterlife. The Testimony manages to show the first Doctor some of the names that he will come to be known by. One is the Imp of the Pandarica, which of course goes back to the fifth season and the 11th Doctor. One is the Butcher of Skull Moon, which is a reference to potentially the Eighth or the War Doctor because this takes place during the Time War. There's also then the Destroyer of Scarrow. You can kind of take your pick on that one, really. And there is the Shadow of the Valyard. Now, the Valyard, this dates back to the sixth Doctor serial, The Trial of a Time Lord. The Valyard was created and is said to be an amalgamation of all of the worst parts of the Doctor, but was effectively set in stone as an incarnation of the Doctor that would come somewhere between the 12th and 13th regenerations. We saw the Valyard during that trial, but we haven't seen him since. But now we don't know what the numbering system is, again, thanks to the events of the Timeless Children. So where and when are we going to meet the Valyard? There seems to be a reason it was included in this episode. Two, the London Underground. The Christmas special, The Snowmen, reintroduces another version of Clara and also brings back a villain from way back in Doctor Who's history. Doctor Simeon is working with the Great Intelligence, who had been an on-again, off-again bad guy of the second Doctor. Now, it could be said that, accidentally, the 11th Doctor gives the Great Intelligence the information that it needs to attack Earth in the past or future, depending on what way that you look at it. The Doctor, almost in an offhand way, describes the London Underground as a great weakness in security for London. In the 1968 serial, The Web of Fear, which aired between February and March, the second Doctor is traveling through space with Jamie and Victoria, and they get embroiled in what is effectively a web in space. Now this is actually part of a plan by the Great Intelligence to attack Earth because suddenly the TARDIS thinks it's landed and then it's actually, they turn up in the underground and it's all a bit surprising to them, but in the future, it's gonna make an awful lot more sense. Now, what is also nice about this Easter egg is that without saying anything, it also calls back to one of the most popular characters of classic Doctor Who, because in The Web of Fear, a young Colonel Lethbridge Stewart is introduced for the very first time, who would of course go on to be the Brigadier, one of the founders of UNIT. Number one, Verity Newman. As the 10th Doctor has experienced the second slowest regeneration in the history of Doctor Who, he goes around to see all of his friends and effectively just make sure everyone's okay while he still can. And one of the people that he visits is an author called Verity Newman, who's signing a book called A Journal of Impossible Things. Back when Doctor Who was being originally conceived, Verity Lambert and Sidney Newman are the two people who are most directly responsible for bringing the show to life. This is a deep, deep dive on Doctor Who history. And it's one thing that seems to be immediately noticeable for some and a kind of a nice voyage of discovery for others. Since this episode aired, the drama An Adventure in Time and Space depicts Sidney Newman and Verity Lambert on screen, which might help some fans understand a little bit more what this Easter egg is doing, but it also gives people a real insight into what the world was like when Doctor Who was coming to life. And that's it for our list today. I know I have missed someone, so please guys drop them into the comments below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Catch us over on Twitter at Who Culture, and you can catch myself at Sean Fer Eric on Twitter as well. Whatever you do until we see you again, make sure you look after yourself, make sure you keep things wibbly wobbly, and you're awesome.